men will be brothers. Embrace, O oh millions. Embrace. Beethoven was just a boy when he fell under the spell of the words of Schiller's poem. By his early teens, he knew he wanted to set them to music. Yet the idea for this piece stayed within him for most of his life. He achieved it only in old age when he was completely deaf. The Ninth Symphony would be his true musical testament. A work inspired by one grand ideal, the coming of the kingdom of the kinship of all mankind in freedom. Beethoven brought music to the new golden age, imagined by Schiller and Goethe, and before them, by Klopstock, whose poem, Ode to Freedom, prefigured Schiller's poem, Ode to Joy. O oh, freedom, silvery sound to the ear, light to consciousness, soaring flight for thought, deep feeling for the heart. The young Schiller loved to pour out his heartfelt sentiments to his friends. My soul is starved for new food, better men, friendships, attachments, and love. Schiller composed his poem, Ode to Joy, in the countryside near Dresden. Beethoven's music would immortalize his words. of Elysium. Fire inspired, we tread thy sanctuary. All men become brothers. You millions embrace. This kiss is for all the world. To express this aspiration meant for Beethoven participating in the great spiritual movement of his time and fully assuming his duty as an artist. Amanda, du. Ich arbeite an meiner neuen Symphonie. Die Sätze stehen schon fest. Sie wird ein Hymnus. Beethoven longed for the world to be governed by these humanistic principles. An early ardent supporter of Napoleon, believing that here was the hero who could realize the political utopia of Plato, the Republic, he dedicated the Third Symphony to him. But he quickly became disillusioned by the aspirations of the self-proclaimed emperor. It was a big disappointment. 
France and its revolution had made a deep impression on him during his youth in Bonn. When the people of Paris stormed the Bastille in order to overthrow the old feudal system, Beethoven and many other students and citizens of Bonn supported them. He wrote in his notebook, these people, you say, are mad. These excited speakers that talk loudly through the streets of France. I too think they are mad, but a free madman speaks words of wisdom while wisdom is silent in the slave. In Paris, the music that will influence Beethoven's work in a significant way is heard for the first time, the music of the revolution. The Ninth Symphony is directly related to the Marseillaise, which sets out to be the unifying voice of all children of the nation. Ihr sagt, die Revolution sei wie Saturn. Sie werde alle ihre Kinder verschlingen. Nein, die Revolution verschlingt nicht ihre Kinder, sondern ihre Feinde. Beethoven can no longer bear Napoleon's voice. He accuses him of devouring his children, betraying the unifying voice of the nation, and becoming just one more tyrant. Despite his disappointment, he never lost the desire to create a monumental work to inspire power in its ideal form. In fact, Beethoven always felt charged with a mission, invested with a duty, a duty that falls to the artist above all others, to conquer freedom, which will not come down from heaven by itself. Beethoven has to open new paths. Which is what he does with his masterwork. He gives to the Ninth Symphony a totally revolutionary form. He mixes elegy, cantatas, Italian opera, German opera, military fanfare, and requiem. Beethoven has created a new art form. Gustav Klimt, founder of the Viennese Secession, also broke with tradition as Beethoven did. In 1902, he created the Beethoven Frieze, an explicit invitation to revisit the Ninth Symphony with transparent symbolism. The pursuit of happiness for the benefit of all will only be realized in the kingdom of joy after the forces of evil are defeated. Gorgons with their long hair of writhing snakes rule together with sickness, madness, and death, all under the shadow of Typhi, the monkey with the opalescent eyes, the only monster, according to Klimt, able to triumph over Zeus Beethoven.
Yes, they were the scandalous figures of gluttony. Lust. Or loneliness. Such are the evils of the corrupted world that prevent a man from being a man. Zwei Dinge, auf dieser Welt reichen aus, um Mensch zu sein. Zwei bloß. Der gestirnte Himmel über mir und das Sittengesetz in mir. Und wenn der Immanuel Kant nichts anderes geschrieben hätte als diesen Satz, er wäre der Größte. Die Gesetze in mir. No. Da brauchten wir ja keine Polizei nicht mehr. Keine Obrigkeit. Was ist das Obrigkeit? Ein altes, zerrissenes Kleid, was sich nicht mehr flicken lässt. Lass gut sein, Ludwig. Wir müssen ja auch halten. Die Sittlichkeit des Menschen ist ja kein Geschenk vom Kaiser. Oder wie? Lese er nur die alten Bücher nach. Vormals in Griechenland. Da hieß es schon nicht mit zu hassen, mit zu lieben bin ich da. Und bei Schiller. Alle Menschen werden Brüder. Dazu verhilft uns kein Dekret von oben. Kein Majestätserlass. Die schöne Gleichheit brauchen wir, damit wir Menschen und Menschenbrüder sein können. A relentless instinct drives Beethoven with the energy of desperation in the pursuit of happiness. Happiness for his fellow man, even before his own. He is the perpetual lone wolf, the suffering soul. Nevertheless, within him, hope and love join forces to vanquish his own internal martyrdom and to propagate this joy inspired by the muses. Joy, beautiful spark of divinity. In his journal, Beethoven wondered, does music not change something in man so that he feels differently? Better, perhaps? More human, let's say. Certainly this happens at the concert, but when he goes back into the street, daily life overwhelms him. But perhaps this strange and rare feeling of the sublime will inspire this man to want to feel it in his daily life as well. And he can feel it again, I'm sure, as soon as he acts compassionately, in accord with moral laws. I am opposed to absolutism. I am against lack of freedom, where people are treated like animals. I have the right to speak my mind where I want, to defend my point of view. 
That is freedom of a sort. But am I perhaps confusing the freedom I enjoy as an artist with freedom of political activity? One cannot mete out freedom. There is no such thing as a little bit of freedom and a little bit of non-freedom, even if it is just the freedom to die. Besagter Beethoven führt weiterhin Reden gegen den Adel als solchen, auch schon in adliger Unterstützung, und dass seine Kompositionen nicht ohne derognädige Unterstützung zu Gehör bringen könnte. Er beißt die Hand, die ihn füttert, Exzellenz. Fernerhin propagiert besagter Beethoven den englischen Parlamentarismus, demokratische Einrichtungen und die sogenannte Volkssouveränität. Ob dahinter eine direkte aufwieglerische Absicht steckt, konnte bisher nicht geklärt werden. Beobachtung des besagten Beethoven wird fortgesetzt, neuer Bericht in vier Wochen. Ungefährlich, absolut ungefährlich, Carlo Retto. Man lasse besagten Herrn reden, was ihm behagt. Wir sind doch nicht so dumm, einen weltbekannten Künstler Pressionen auszusetzen. Falls ich mir die Bemerkung erlauben darf, Exzellenz, wo die Politik anfängt, hört die Kunst auf. Exzellenz waren stets gegen Nachsicht in Dingen der Staatsräson. Ein Künstler, der über Politik spricht. Wie unseriös. Das Wort des hochverehrten Goethe. Wilde Künstler, rede nicht, hat sich auch bei uns durchgesetzt. Nicht eingreifen, Carlo Wetz. Nur ja nicht. Verzeihen, Exzellenz. Stammt das Zitat vom Geheimrat Goethe? Oder vom Dichter Goethe? Metternich, a skillful dialectician, knows that if Beethoven's music can express a kind of revolt, it can also help warrant the legitimacy of the existing power. In 1814, he commissions him to write a cantata for the Congress of Europe, which sets him on the threshold of the German pantheon. Through Bismarck, Beethoven will find a place in the upper ranks of the pantheon, in spite of himself. Bismarck proclaimed about the Ninth Symphony, were I to hear this music often, I would be bolder. Eager to embolden his troops, Bismarck drafted Beethoven in his battle for the reunification of Germany. Admittedly, the Ninth has touches of military fanfares that lend themselves to certain appropriations, but that was not enough for the Iron Chancellor who claimed it as his own and renamed the Ninth Symphony the Bismarck Symphony, just like that. Beethoven was thus cast post-mortem in his role of inspiration to the conquering German race. Poor Beethoven. He who thought that with his music he was to open a new heaven for the soul of man and to unveil the presence of divinity in the details of everyday life. Wagner himself was ready to tear up all the music of the past, with the exception of the Ninth Symphony by his idol Beethoven, convinced that it was the only cry of universal human love. Just as Bakunin, the flamboyant anarchist, was ready to burn all Western values at the stake, but to spare Beethoven and his ode to joy. Wagner followed Bakunin during the Dresden riots in 1849. A disciple of the gospel of the art of the future, he heeded the words of Engels, who, as an admirer of Beethoven, would try to integrate him into the fledgling Marxist movement. Beethoven, anarchist. Beethoven, Marxist. Or Beethoven, illuminist. Karl Holtz, his personal secretary, stated that Beethoven was a Freemason and belonged to the Illuminist Lodge. Also in the same lodge were Schiller, Goethe, Herder, Klopstock, and they called each other brothers. 
brother, the most universal, highest, most honorable title one man can give to another. But brothers often go to war. symphony is the finest battle hymn ever composed. Therefore, Beethoven is often called to the front. Yet he is the prophet of a far different battle than one where men kill each other. Beethoven doesn't belong in either camp. The Allies think that they alone hold the moral high ground and want to forbid the Germans a single note of the Ode to Joy. The Germans care nothing for their enemies' opinions. Beethoven is German, and they wave his values like a flag. How can the armies on both sides of the trenches claim Beethoven's values and be the new criminals of Europe? He would not have heard the cannon's roar. His kingdom, it seems, is not of this world, full of sound and fury. A terrible silence has descended upon him. Beethoven would have to struggle with the worst misfortune ever to befall a musician, profound deafness. From the depths of an immense solitude, he would deliver to the world the masterpiece intended to unite all mankind. He would never hear a single note, though touchingly he tried doubling the strings on his piano. Was this the price he had to pay to the heavens so that the world's best loved music could resonate in him? Und sie mir dann so stehen? Bin ich dir denn zu groß geworden? Was deinem Thron zu nahe kommt, nimmst du, du eifersüchtiger Gott zerbrechen? politicians heard a song of war or revolution resonate. Others heard the echoes of a sacred hymn. As if Beethoven, deaf, had transcribed his own requiem. Kannst du aufbegehren gegen ihn? Du bist das Werkzeug in seiner Hand. Warum muss ich dann mein Gehör verlieren? Warum? Am Ende. Um eine Musik zu vernehmen, wie sie eines Menschen Ohr noch nie vernommen hat. Eine Musik der Freude, der Zuversicht, des Glaubens. Eine Musik, wie sie Engel im Himmel anstehen. 
freuen. Gott ist mit dir. Immer und ewig. In deiner größten Not wirst du ihn ganz verstehen werden. From now on, nothing could deflect Beethoven from this internal voice, resounding ever stronger within him. To the Gloria of the Ninth Symphony, a profane cantata is superimposed. To the Christian Beethoven succeeds a Dionysian Beethoven, passionately pouring the best of himself out for humanity. I am Bacchus, pressing his delicious nectar for mankind. In the aftermath of World War I, Arthur Nikisch established that every 31st of December, the Ninth Symphony would be played in Leipzig. Every year since, at the stroke of midnight, the Ode to Joy explodes like an immense secular mass. composing the Ninth Symphony, Beethoven was generally considered the greatest man in Europe. He was said to represent the greatness of man better than all the philosophers, all the politicians and men of faith put together. With these words, Beethoven is immortalized while still alive. I don't know of anything more beautiful than the Appassionata, declared Lenin. I could listen to it every day, a wondrous piece of music that is beyond human. I always think with pride, maybe with a naive pride, look at the miracles that a man could create. Despite Engels' insistence on the universal appeal of the Ninth Symphony, the Marxists hesitated between the two works, but ended up choosing the Internationale as a musical symbol, unlike Germany's nationalistic appropriation of Beethoven. However, Beethoven remained a value that the Marxists wanted to claim. Of course, neither composer Pierre de Geiter nor lyricist Eugène Poitier ever earned a reputation that approached that of their famous predecessor. It would take more than creating the Internationale to rival Beethoven. And Engels proclaimed, in the great proletarian class struggle, the divine spark of joy shines. The day when humanity, free and matured by the fight of proletarian socialism, will be educated to the sound of the universal hymn of the ninth. The day when it will become the credo of its soul. Then Beethoven's art will finally return whence it came, to life. In March 1927, the 100th anniversary of Beethoven's death, the Russian delegate to the commemorative festivities, Olga Kamaneva, 
recalling Engel's words, asserted the educational role of Beethoven. The recent invention of the radio would also allow Beethoven and the Ninth Symphony to be heard in the remotest corners of all the socialist republics. Government radio, she insisted, would be the fundamental tool of a revolutionary transformation of the relationship between the people and Beethoven. This time, Ludwig had been drafted by the Marxists. During this centennial year, Soviet Russia adopted the Ninth Symphony. In the United States, the Columbia Phonograph Company recorded Beethoven's symphonies for the first time in the world under the direction of Felix Weingartner, linking itself forever with the composer. to spread Beethoven's music to everyone, to summon all to the deepest meditation. Franz Liszt had done it already in his day. Liszt transposed Beethoven's symphonies for piano, particularly the ninth in a remarkable arrangement for four hands. Wagner did so as well in homage to their illustrious predecessor and master. During the same year, 1927, Ode to Joy played the role of global hymn for peace. President Calvin Coolidge of the United States participated personally in the centennial celebrations. He declared, Beethoven was a true Democrat and his message is vital for our times. At precisely the same time, at a ceremony in Leningrad, the highest authorities paid tribute to the Ninth. Not to be outdone, in France, statesman Raymond Poincaré organized a solemn concert at the Sorbonne. In the United States, Beethoven is a Democrat. In Moscow, he's a revolutionary. And in France, he embodies the hero of the Republic. Vincent Dandy conducted this national anthem of humanity that is the ninth. That same year in Germany, Marshal Hindenburg declared, today tears stain the faces of all German families, but Beethoven taught us that a person who can open up to his music will not be downcast. He comforts us in our suffering. He guides us through life's hardships and vicissitudes. On January 30th, 1933, Hitler ousts Hindenburg and becomes Chancellor of the Reich. For Hitler, no treaty from Versailles will ever destroy the fortress of Beethoven. The instability of the Weimar Republic brought him to power. Faced with what he called Judeo-Bolshevik communism, Hitler wanted to turn Beethoven into the true Führer of the German people. The first festival of the Nazi era opens in Bayreuth, not with Wagner, but with Beethoven and his Ninth Symphony under the direction of Richard Strauss. Hitler annexes Bayreuth and Beethoven and Wagner at the same time. Alfred Rosenberg, founder of the mythology of the Reich, proclaims the nationalization of German music and demonstrates how Beethoven and Wagner are the two poles, the happy union of which is embodied in the person of Adolf Hitler. Who are they kidding? Musik ist die Sprache, die alle Völker eint und deren Zeichen sich alle lieben und achten müssen.
What game are they playing? They are accessories to the most appalling crimes against humanity, yet they swoon listening to someone singing, Man is brother to all men. Would this be the last flicker of humanity, the cult of beauty? After Bayreuth, Strauss meets again with Hitler, Beethoven, and the Ninth Symphony in Berlin on the occasion of the 1936 Olympics. Moved, Pierre de Coubertin would invoke Schiller's words to praise the muscular harmonies stronger than death itself. to come out on top. Thank you very kindly. All men are brothers. Of course, except for all the people whose land we want to annex, and except for the Jews and blacks and others too numerous to mention. That's how Hans Eisler satirizes Nazism. With his Hymn to Solidarity, Eisler asserts himself as a disciple of Beethoven, who is, in his eyes, the first anti-fascist musician. Whereas, to the warmongers, Beethoven's work is the manifestation of a racial vision of the world, written in the key of eternity. Perspektive der Kunst. Solch einen Anblick wünsche ich mal dem Erzherzog. Bloß wenn er den hätte, wäre er kein Erzherzog. Ich glaube, für das Geld, was den Kaiser eine Kanone kostet, könnte man alle Schuhe Wiens kostenlos besohlen. Meine natürlich zuerst, weil ich drauf gekommen bin. Na also, kein Wölkchen. Kaiser, kannst deine Kanone behalten. Josef Goebbels proposed that Hitler's 1937 birthday celebrations include a performance of the Ninth by Furtwangler and the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. The new emperor has rolled out his cannons and made Beethoven his gunner. Unlike Furtwangler shaking hands with the devil, Bill Dixon in the U.S. gives a jazzy rendition of the ninth. The War of the Conductors has begun. In the U.S. and in England, they play it regularly, featuring many musicians, Jewish exiles, who are determined not to let Hitler be sole master of the German cultural heritage. Bruno Walter in New York. In Germany, Abendroth, musician of the Reich. Toscanini for the Allies' victory. Clemens Krauss, Nazi ambassador. Mengelberg records the ninth in Paris. The orchestral expansion of the Reich rolls on. Karajan, member of the Nazi party since 1933, conducts the ninth at the Trocadero. Throughout World War II, the Ninth Symphony would be the most frequently played work in the entire symphonic repertoire. Mussolini, for his part, trains the Italian ear to appreciate Beethoven. Pietro Mascani will be his prophet. To Mascani, nothing is too big to serve Beethoven. Sometimes up to 7,000 musicians play under his conducting, honoring the Christ-like figure of Beethoven, because according to Mascani, even Christ shines brighter under Beethoven.
Bascani, the black shirt maestro, writes, he died like Jesus. Like Jesus, he was resurrected in the blinding light of his art. Beethoven will be resurrected for the good of humanity. Immortal in history, immortal in art, immortal in our hearts. Hearts that will beat for him and his glory per omnia secula seculorum. The Vatican encourages the admiration of Beethoven, a Christian model to be followed. But Pius XII will not create a Beethoven religion, Mascani style, where Beethoven would take the place of Christ. Pope Pius XII preferred to leave Beethoven on earth and to give the heavens to God. Elsewhere, under different skies, Beethoven was summoned to preside over other ceremonies. Where the best sons of Japan, the elite of the nation, were destined to reach heaven twice. First, to get to their target. Second, to get to paradise, just a little higher up. One last prayer, a last cup of sake, their hearts still resounding with the words of Ode to Joy, played especially for them. Joy, bright spark of divinity, daughter of Elysium. Fire inspired, we tread thy sanctuary. Beethoven kamikaze. Beethoven enters the pantheon of the rising sun. To this day, every year, he is honored. The question is, how can such different people claim such an intimacy with this symphony, be they warriors, pacifists, victims, or executioners? April 20th, 1945, Radio Berlin salutes Hitler's birthday with Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. Ten days later, it announces his suicide with the Ninth Symphony. Deutsche Wehrmacht, meine Kameraden. Der Führer ist gefallen. Getreu seiner großen Idee, die Völker Europas vor dem Bolschewismus zu bewahren, hat er sein Leben eingesetzt, und den Helden tot gefunden. Mit ihm ist einer der größten Helden deutscher Geschichte dahingegangen. In stolzer Ehrfurcht und Trauer senken wir vor ihm die Fahne.
As soon as Toscanini learns of the fall of the Reich and the deaths of Hitler and Mussolini, he revives Verdi's Hymn of Nations as a meaningful gesture. Major work, Verdi's hymn was commissioned by the Committee of London's Great Exhibition of 1862. The hymn is dedicated to the peace between people and to freedom, and outlines the desire for a world of brotherhood similar to the one dreamed by Beethoven. However, Verdi did not intend to rival the monumental Ninth Symphony, which, after the war ended, was exported as never before. Young people turn it into their ode to the new America. Even China would gladly adopt it. But the Cultural Revolution would decide otherwise. From simple Marxist, Beethoven now officially becomes a Soviet citizen. But the diktats have a hard time changing their habits. The freedom preached by Beethoven is once again misunderstood. We are very happy tonight that this is an exchange of our cultures from one land to another. There certainly could be no finer way to achieve understanding and friendship than through this cultural exchange. And uh, there will be a song of peace which comes from the words of Schiller, from the very simple melody of the Beethoven Ninth. Alla menschen werden Brüder. Alla menschen werden Brüder. All men are brothers. And so we send you here tonight, to you of the German People's Democratic Republic, to the lands of socialism, and to peoples of all the world of Asia and Africa, words of friendship and peace. Was the great Paul Robeson aware of what kind of masquerade he was involved in? Brother, sing your country's anthem, shout your land's undying fame. Light the wondrous tale of nations with your people's golden name. Tell your father's noble story, raise on high your country's sign, join then in the final glory, brother lift your flag with mine. Build the road of peace before 
before us, build it wide and deep and long. Speed the slow and check the eager, help the weak and curb the strong. None shall push aside another, none shall let another fall. March beside me, oh my brothers, all for one and one for all. Robeson's personal adaptation of the lyrics turned the Ode to Joy into a true Negro spiritual. Despite the wall separating them, the Ninth would be a common national anthem for the two Germanys, represented by one single delegation at the Olympic Games of 1952 and 1959. The sergeant shouted again, Rasche! Nochmal von fahren anfangen! In einer Minute will ich wissen, wie viel ich zur Gaskammer abliefere! They began again. First, slowly. One, two, three, four, became faster and faster, so fast that it finally sounded like a stampede of wild horses. And all of a sudden, in the middle of it, they began singing the In a tremendous symbolic gesture, the Beethoven Orchestra of Bonn plays Schoenberg's A Survivor from Warsaw and, without a pause, goes straight into the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven. The Jewish prayer is joined by Beethoven's. try to bind the wounds, remembering that although nothing will ever excuse such heinous crimes, men should one day become brothers again. On May 7, 2000, the survivors of Mauthausen were invited to hear the Ninth in the camp where they were tortured. Can a Beethoven concert teach us anything in memory of the unspeakable? It is very important that it is understood but none of us consider this to be a concert. The 186 steps of the Mauthausen Quarry, the Death Stairs, mark the worst instrument of mass exhaustion. The Jews dug this immense pit with their own hands. Why is it here? Because on May 5, 1938, the city of Vienna awarded the contract for granite to the gentlemen of the Munich SS. But today, in the quarry, who welcomes who? Can Simon Rattle honestly think that it's a manifestation of the soul of universal values that could survive even the most appalling crimes? Yes, of course, it is always possible to be wrong. It is always possible to regret. But we all believe that we must try. <laughs>
And now, what do we do? Do we clap? Request an encore? Or nothing? Dead silence. Since both the best and the worst can identify with it, is the ninth meaningless? In 1845, at the inauguration of the first monument to Beethoven in the Cathedral Square in Bonn, a great concert took place and the ninth was played. A copy of the first printed edition of the symphony was set into the base of the statue. It had become the foundation stone of Europe. Beethoven looks out over Europe. Europe rises to meet Beethoven's gaze. Beethoven would have been 200 years old, the year that Ode to Joy officially became the anthem of Europe. If the visit of President Schumann, one of the founding fathers of the European Union, to the birthplace of Beethoven illustrates the composer's ties to Europe, it wasn't until 1971 that the European Council adopted Resolution 462, making the fourth movement of the Ninth Symphony the European anthem. We are delighted to be here tonight in the home where this orchestra was born. I have always passionately believed this great European Union could not survive just as an economic union. We need for our citizens to perceive us, not just sending edicts from Brussels, but to perceive us as having a heart and a soul and to giving our young people a future and a way of life. The history of the European anthem actually goes back to August 1949, when Paul Henry Spock, first European president, received a musical score composed by an ordinary citizen, Jean-Louis Godet. Dear President, Please allow a mother who suffered all kinds of troubles during the last war to address this song to you. It is a call to unity for all the world's people who desire peace and dream of joining forces to create the United States of Europe. Would you consider making this the anthem of the United Nations? Sincerely, Jean-Louis Godet. After Jean-Louis Godet, Hundreds of letters and amateur compositions arrive at the European Council, the Italian, German, Dutch, and French parliaments, hymns, marches, cantatas. They all end up forgotten. Inno all'Europa, soprattutto delle scuole primarie, ci hanno pregato di pubblicare un inno. Ah, c'è formidabile. E sa, donc, c'è musica di autori sivori. Hmm. In 1962, to stop the flow of hundreds of musical propositions, the Council of the European Community turned to Beethoven and published a European anthem based on the melody of Ode to Joy. In 1964, this proposal was taken up again by the Congress of Rome in hopes that a European anthem would finally be chosen. Beethoven's name had been evoked numerous times in the task of getting the European countries closer to one another. Several attempts were made in that direction, like Cyprian Katsaris did, for example, by blending the Marseillaise and Haydn's German anthem with Beethoven's Ninth. Finally, 
Resolution 462 entrusted the musical creation of the anthem to Herbert von Karajan, who in February 1972 would compose an arrangement of the prelude to Ode to Joy, which from then on would be used for all European events. time the United Nations toyed with the idea of a world anthem and again the Ninth Symphony was considered. Where the United Nations hesitated, Ian Smith did not. After declaring Rhodesia independent, he also grabbed the Ode to Joy and made it the anthem of apartheid, replacing God Save the Queen. On August 27, 1974, the new anthem resounds. Rise, O voices of Rhodesia, God may we thy bounty share. Give us strength to face all danger, and where challenge is to dare. The United Nations unanimously condemns Rhodesia and declares a complete embargo. The Ode to Joy escapes the embargo since it is in the public domain, as long as it's not the version by Carrie Ann. So anyone is free to use it as they see fit, including segregationists. Disillusioned with the use of his work, Beethoven leaves this world, perhaps to visit others less likely to betray him. Beethoven is part of the best of compilation disc recorded by NASA in Houston in 1977 and sent into space aboard Voyager in case the aliens have a record player that works. Beethoven shines in the firmament, a star among stars. NASA technicians chose the fifth symphony for the galaxies, keeping the ninth for us Earthlings, maybe thinking that it hasn't yet fulfilled its mission. Beethoven might have done the same, despite his disappointment with humanity. For in his secret dreams, he hoped to become immortal among men rather than Martians. He could always dream that one day, in the four corners of the world, the Ninth Symphony would play for a good cause.
Even in his worst nightmares, Beethoven couldn't have envisioned paying such a price for immortality. Others, too, have dreamed of immortality. On May 21st, 1981, François Mitterrand could have asked Daniel Berenboim to play the Marseillaise among the tombs of the Pantheon. But what better choice than the Ninth Symphony, when the point you're making is that this is where freedom and democracy began. Once again, the Ninth Symphony rings out in 1989 as the Berlin Wall falls to the jackhammers of democracy. For the occasion, Leonard Bernstein conducts an orchestra made up of musicians from both Germany's and the four allied nations. Bernstein returns to the text that inspired Schiller and replaces the word joy with the word freedom. Here, more than anywhere, the European anthem becomes the ode to freedom. Beethoven had written on a page in a school book his first aspirations. To do all the good that one can do, to love freedom above all, never to deny the truth, even in the face of the powerful. The final truth is that peace can only come from within your own hearts as an expression of your own deepest longing, as a revulsion against those who drove men to destroy their very own families to feed mad ambitions. And when, in 1996, Yehudi Menuhin plays the Ninth Symphony in the ruins of Sarajevo, he embodies the beliefs to which Beethoven was faithful all his life. Beethoven had arrived at the end of his masterpiece exhausted. The fire inside him had consumed his body. This burning fire would end up dazzling the whole world around him. As if he had not stopped following the mysterious call to instill in the hearts of men this hope of fraternity. Beethoven has been able to convince the best of men, but also to fascinate the worst. 
all have projected onto him the embodiment of their utopias. So far, the worst of them have been realized. Surely there's reason to hope that the best ones will be realized too. My kingdom is not of this world. That's how Klimt summed up his interpretation of Beethoven's vision. Did he want to deprive the world of those hopes? Or maybe he wasn't bold enough to say, my kingdom is of this world, as soon as you, men, understand the true meaning of the joy of brotherhood. Embrace, O oh millions, embrace. Gladly, like the heavenly bodies, which he set on their courses through the splendor of the firmament, thus, brothers, you should run your race as a hero going to conquest.